What's the best way to prepare for disaster? It's a question lots of people are asking these days as the planet heats up and we face one unprecedented disaster after another. My interest in disasters started with one specific disaster that took place in Chicago in July 1995, one of the deadliest heat waves in U.S. history so far. We go to extremes in Chicago, and that's why people love Chicago. We go to extremes. I walked into the room, and I saw my grandmother lying across the bed, face up. I looked over at the window, and it was nailed shut. sexiness for the news media was it was about the heat. But the real story is, why were people in these neighborhoods dying? People weren't dying on the north side. People weren't dying in the Gold Coast. People were dying on the south and west sides. The minute you see the refrigerator trucks, that means there's so many dead bodies that the coroner doesn't have room for them anymore. That's enough. I think it's really about the heat. Not really about the heat. There is no need for as much poverty in our community as there is. It's a story about these deeper social fault lines that make some members of a city vulnerable and keep others protected and blissfully ignorant about what's happening to people who live quite close to them. Do you think they're addressing that? Do I think the city is addressing the extreme poverty in communities of color in Chicago? Is that what you're asking me? <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. So what's the best way to prepare for disaster? I guess it depends on where you live. Welcome to Cook Survivor by Zip Code, Racism as a Public Health Crisis at the College of Staten Island. My name is Nora Santiago. I'm an urban policy analyst here at CSI. It is my honor to host this evening virtually. Our country has been grappling with deep-rooted issues with regards to racial equity, social justice, while simultaneously battling a global pandemic. My Office of Sustainable Community Planning has been focused on raising awareness, fostering dialogue, and supporting education to eradicate this issue. Last November, we focused our GIS Day on racial equity, social justice, and sustainability. In February, we co-sponsored an event with the group called Blacks in GIS, the Black Family, Racial Equity, and Resilience. Tonight, we continued the dialogue about racial equity, for tonight's event, we partnered with the Department of Social Work and the library. I hope you have the chance to watch the documentary Cooked Survivor by Zip Code. And if not, make sure you watch it after this event. This film has been viewed across the country, raising awareness surrounding the public health crisis many communities face and brought to the forefront with the COVID-19 pandemic. I know the first time I saw the movie, I had to share it with others. The movie reminds me of what we learned here on Staten Island after Superstorm Sandy and are now expecting with the pandemic. The question in my mind is why do we have to wait for a disaster, especially when there's a public health crisis that exists today in our communities? Let me now introduce our panelists for our evening's event. I am pleased and honored to have the director of the movie, Cooked Survivor by Zip Code, Judy Halpin. New York City's uh, Department of Health first appointed Deputy Commissioner and Chief Equity Officer, Dr. Torian Easterling. The Staten Island Borough President's Office, Director of Health and Health Wellness, Dr. Ginny Montello. An associate professor of director of social work program at the College of Staten Island, Dr. Myra Murphy. It is now my pleasure to begin tonight's program by welcoming our president, Dr. William J. Fritz. Dr. Fritz, welcome. Okay, thank you, Nora. 
And good evening, and thank you to everyone uh, for joining us uh, tonight. Special thanks uh, for our panel members who will lead us through a critical conversation based in part on the excellent documentary, Cooked Survival by Zip Code by Judith Hefflin. I encourage all of you, as Nora said, who have not done so, uh, it's well worth your time to view the movie. Uh, the documentary reveals that the deaths were a result of a confluence of factors unrelated to the heat, poverty, racism, social isolation. More importantly, these issues continue to exist throughout the United States. Ultimately, this document or this documentary and this discussion tonight will ask us to question the morality of our national policies. Right now in the United States, we are having discussions on racism as a public health threat. In June of 2020, the American Medical Association issued its pledge to confront racism and recognize racism as a public health threat and put forth a plan to mitigate its efforts. Some of the issues that need to be addressed are touched on in the documentary. Access issues for underserved communities, access to healthy food, and access to health care. This year, we have re-emphasized our commitment to equity, inclusion, and belonging at the College of Staten Island, and to ensuring a welcoming environment for all. Part of that commitment means being able to come together and engage in open and honest conversations about matters that may make us feel uncomfortable in order for us to grow and bring about positive change. Tonight's event is another step in the fulfillment of that commitment. Earlier this year, I challenged everyone on campus to participate in a 21-day equity habit building challenge modeled after the 21-day challenge created by Dr. Eddie Moore, Jr. Dr. Moore built this model on the theory that it takes 21 days to form a new habit. Student Affairs uh, has hosted an event, What Does Racial Equity Mean to Me?, in which a diverse group of CSI students and faculty share their thoughts on this question, as well as strategies for achieving racial equity. The event featured a reading by distinguished professor and award-winning poet, Patricia Smith. Importantly, we have reconstituted our diversity council and renewed our commitment to closing all equity gaps to ensure that CSI is representative of the community we serve. I'm also excited by our work with the Staten Island Equity and Belonging Project, a group led by our social work department, including professors Paul Archibald, Myra Humphreys and Christine Flynn Saunier, that is meeting to listen to solutions on how equity and belonging can be supported and sustained on Staten Island. One focus of this group is addressing access to affordable and nutritious food and recognizing it as a cornerstone of good health. In closing, it's my hope that everyone will take the lessons from tonight's panel discussion and challenge yourself to commit to listening, learning, sharing, engaging, and opening yourself up to making meaningful changes that will help create a more welcoming, equitable, and inclusive community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fritz. Before we continue with our program, I would like to go over a format of tonight's event. And I have some housekeeping rules to share as well. During the event, all attendees will be muted. After the presentations, you will have the opportunity to ask questions in the chat. We will try to answer as many questions as we can. Please send your questions to Amy Stampler, our chief librarian in the chat throughout the program. When you submit your question, please indicate whatever your question is directed to a specific panelist. If you are interested in learning more about our distinguished speakers, links to their videos, please, sorry, their bios, we will share in this chat and also made available at the CSI Library website with some additional resources on tonight's topic. And now I am so pleased and honored to introduce our moderator for tonight's event, Dr. Paul Archibald. Dr. Archibald is an assistant professor in the Department of Social Work at the College of Staten Island. 
Good evening, everyone. So, and we thank you for joining us. Um, so as we are in this process of undoing racism, um, we wanna really start our panel with a land acknowledgement. And the land acknowledgement is a way to really insert an awareness of indigenous presence and land rights in everyday life. The College of Staten Island is on the island known as Aquahunga, Wanakwang, the homeland of the Lenape people. CSI pays respect to the original stewards of this land, Lenape and other indigenous peoples, and is committed to supporting the intertribal Native American First Nations and indigenous communities that continue to thrive in New York City. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of dismantling the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism and reminds us of our important connection to this land where we live, where we learn and where we work. We recognize and honor and respect these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and water on which we are now present. Thank you. So let us set the stage for our panelists for the discussion. When we, when we talk about race, race is not rooted in biology but it's a social, political, economic, and it's a cultural construct. It was developed over time and over context, right? Um, Ta-Nehisi Coates in his book, Between the World and Me, he writes in the form of a letter from a father to a son, and he coined the phrase, race is the child of racism, not the father. So if race is the child and not the father, that is saying that race is birth from racism, right? So we need to understand the racism. So let's look at the, what we call the ABC model of racism. It proposes three components. The A represents the affective component. That's where the prejudicial feelings towards a group of people rely. Then the B is the behavioral component that represents the discriminatory acts towards a group of people. The C, it encompasses the cognitive aspect. The stereotypes, which are the cognition, it rationalizes people's prejudices, beliefs that then lead to a discrimination and a behavior, right? So there's many arguments about the definition of racism. Most recently, pe people are asking that racism should be viewed beyond an ideology, right? And more in terms of a racialized social system. So an example of this is when you look through the lens of slavery, which lasted from 1619 to 1865, nearly 250 years. The newly free slaves, they had to contend with the policies such as the Black Code, the Jim Crow laws that, that implemented more oppression, restricted their liberties and their rights and segregated to the South, which then affected health outcomes. There's been some research that show that for the first 20 years after slavery was abolished, the health of Blacks greatly declined, especially those living in the Southern states. There's really a lot of research being done now that really look at inequities in resources as a real cause of the mortality rates among Black populations. Um, it revealed that if the US had smaller income gaps that was really like comparative to some of the Western European nation, 880,000 deaths per year could be avoided. If the US had developed social policies targeting the inequalities and mortality rates, 686,000 deaths could be averted. If they found that social determinant of health factors in the US were responsible for the mortality rates. Low education accounted for 245,000 deaths, 162,000 attributed, attributed to racial segregation, 133,000 were caused by poverty at the individual level. So what's happening now is that the field of public health is really starting to recognize that racism as a racialized social system is a factor in health. There's studies again that show extensive, extensive meta-analysis that looked at over 300 studies and found a great association between self-reported racism and poor health behaviors. What has been good about what's happening is that the CDC recently, under the leadership of the new CDC director, Dr. Rochelle Walensky, she's quoted publicly that racism is a serious public health threat that directly affects the well-being of millions of Americans. So today, 
at the College of Staten Island, we are starting to stimulate this discussion about racism as a public health crisis. Confronted the impact of racism on public health, it's not going to be an easy feat. However, we've come today to start the undoing by collectively and collaboratively dialoguing what the impact of racism on public health has been and what we can do together that we could not do alone. So let's get this started. Orrin told me that much of the vacant land on the south and west sides of the city and the slow motion disaster that's unfolding in those communities can be traced back to another map. This one created by the Federal Housing Administration in 1940. The neighborhoods where black people had settled were shaded in red and declared ineligible for federally insured loans. The only way people could buy a home was through a practice called contract buying, which was essentially a high risk and usurious installment plan. White speculators bought homes, then resold them to black families for two or three times their value. But the black family didn't own the house until they fully paid it off. If I have you in a contract and things go along and you get laid off from your job and you miss a month, you could do it on one month or miss two months, then you're out of that house. I evict you. And then I can recontract that same house to another family. Most people had to work two or three jobs to meet the payments. Often, they couldn't afford to maintain the houses, so a lot of those structures needed to be torn down. So when the federal government made it illegal to give mortgages in the black communities, it was a political decision to disinvest from those communities. You have banks making a decision, your house isn't worth replacing the windows, so we're not going to give you a loan to replace your windows. We're not going to give anyone a loan to buy your house from you. That's a disinvestment. We're going to close these stores and move them. And that disinvestment happened with the changes in manufacturing. You don't have steel workers in Inglewood anymore. You don't have people working at Campbell's Soup Factory anymore. Then what happens is your community sinks. It doesn't happen overnight, but it happens certainly <laughs> at, a, at a pace. None of this is rocket science. We all know what, what it takes to make a, a, a healthy neighborhood. It doesn't require you to have mansions on the street. It requires you to have the grocery stores, the coffee shops, the restaurants, the beauty parlors, the barber shops. These are all institutions that help make streets safe, that they provide places for people to go for help. They provide places, certainly in the wintertime and summertime, for cooling and, and heating. This map is, in a sense, an exemplar or a model of all of those issues coming together in one place. For example, communities that have no supermarkets in them. If you map out vacant lots, violent crime rates, was it diabetes, breast cancer, and on and on and on. And so map after map after map shows the distribution of the highest mortality and morbidity throughout the city. These are things human beings created. Let me be really clear. Racism is not a disaster. It's something that human beings invented and created and keep healthy. Segregation is something human beings invented, specific human beings, for specific purposes. The health inequities that exist are not accidents. They're created by people. So the slow motion disaster in Chicago was the direct result of public policies that effectively divided the city into haves and have-nots. And it was precisely 
these life and death inequalities that motivated Dr. Whitman to step down from his post as the city's chief epidemiologist to lead the Sinai Urban Health Institute. His goal, to close the health disparity gap. We've done study after study and published it in all of our most prestigious journals showing not only that black people and other poor people have much worse health, but in fact that the differences in health and measures of health are growing worse everywhere we look in Chicago. And the reason that's happening is because the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and the poor are not only getting poorer, but they're getting sicker as well. We're so excited to have, oh my goodness. Can you hear me now? We're so excited to have Judith here with us, who is the director of this great film. And so Judith, we're gonna start with you, okay? And, and, just okay. Watching, <laughs> and just watching some of these clips that we just watched. And for those of us who had the time to watch uh, this incredible film, what really inspired you to make this movie? Well, um, first of all, I just want to say it's a real honor to be here and I so appreciate all the work that you're doing and all the thinking that you're doing and your commitment and um, I'm really honored to be a part of it and I'm coming to you from the Lenape land of uh, West 84th Street and Riverside Drive. Um, Thank you. Um, right on the Hudson River. Um, what inspired me? Well, initially, and I say this in the film, I mean, I was inspired because initially when I read this really great book by Eric Kleinenberg, who teaches at NYU now, though he is a native son of Chicago, and the book being um, Heat Wave, Social Autopsy of Disaster in Chicago. When I read it, there were two profound things. One was I had spent, you know, uh, the greater part of that summer in 1995 in an air-conditioned editing room um, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan working on a film about a, a, a personal crisis that I had had cancer caused by, you know, um, the, a very carcinogenic anti-miscarriage drug. So I was so deeply inside my own crisis of making this personal documentary. I don't think I realized, like, I wasn't paying attention. So I did not remember that 739 citizens had died in a week in Chicago because of an extreme heat wave. And I could not believe that I couldn't remember that. I was also making a film about climate change at the time. Um, the film ultimately was is called um, Everything's Cool. And we were following stories of climate change messengers and stories of climate change in the United States. And this was a story about the climate crisis in the United States, but it, it, it couldn't be a little sliver in a movie, like it almost deserved its whole thing. So I optioned the rights to this book. And, um, and then the, the more that I like sort of read this book, the more that I realized that it's like, why does it take, and the more I understood Eric's thesis, uh, and the more that I understood about the uh, that the, that they did not really die of the heat, right? But they they died of extreme disparity and extreme inequity and extreme economic isolation, um, uh, and they dis and they died of of a lack of like really serious infrastructure, or in some cases a lack of social cohesion that is not about wealth, but is it about vibrancy and, and a main street that can create that um, and an understanding of that. But so, so, so that, those were my initial reasons, but I would say that, you know, you fall in love with a topic or you fall in awe of a question, but you have to continue to fall in love with it. You really do, especially if it's gonna take almost 18 years to make a movie. And in my mind, the real thing that everything shifted when I realized, like, when I really understood, really, really understood the 
the implications of the heat death poverty map that Dr. Whitman created. And when I really understood that, as he described it to me, and based on all of the research that his organization, who he left the city to go work for, the Sinai Urban Health Institute, that in his words, you know, Black people were dying of racism in extraordinary numbers every year. But unless they die all at once because of a hurricane or a heat wave or some catastrophic disaster that everyone kind of agree is a disaster, they might be dying of treatable diseases. And those numbers are not going to be aggregated all at the same time so that we could actually see it. So then it takes a traditional disaster to push us to see what's really going on. And that is sort of like my big question now. It's like, why do we have to wait for a precedent setting disaster when we have all the precedent setting public health data that we need to see who is dying, where they're dying, why they're dying, what they're dying of, and, um, and have been for decades and decades and decades and that you could t tie it back to this original map of segregation, which is not an original map, but a very important set of legislative maps. So that's why I ultimately made this movie is to really question what do we mean by disaster? Why is our definition so narrow and actually so racist? And what if we redefined it? And what if along with that, we redefine disaster preparedness and disaster prevention, and we actually looked at that whole infrastructure. Thank you. Those are some really great points, and I, I wrote some of them down. So we, we'll see if we, we get to some of these as, as we're moving forward. And, and so based on what you just said, right, your inspiration for getting this movie started, how did you move into this conclusion? And you started talking about it a little bit, that racism is a public health crisis. Well, you know, I mean, that's not my, that, that was really, that was Dr. Whitman's analysis, right? I mean, and he would even say that, you know, yes, I mean, that, that was his, that has been his analysis for a very, very, very long time. And unfortunately, he's not, he's not living. He unfortunately died of uh, cancer before the film actually launched. Um, that was his analysis. And you know, my 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 producing team and the people that we worked with at Contemquin Films in Chicago and, you know, all of the people that you see in the movie, I mean, this was everybody's analysis. I mean, it's I mean, it's it's the it, it was every it's everybody's analysis in different ways. And um, it just became very clear that the that that the, the thing that I could offer with this film was a an opportunity to kind of look at this paradigm, of how we're leaning on the climate crisis to push us to look at the underlying disaster of extreme structural racism, and that they're inextricably connected. But because it's been so hard for our country to look at race, you know, in the face, and really deal with it. Yes. We've been relying on all of these other disasters, you know, inc including COVID, to like push us to actually have to deal with racism and inequity and all of the institutions that have been built around it um, and are killing people every single day. So, you know, at, at a certain point, uh, I I decided to in insert myself in it and to to add uh, this to to add to add my to add my white analysis because i actually thought it would help when we brought this out that it would help the white community to actually be able to kind of like co connect the dots and do so in a way that um that that eases them into this conversation um and and looks at this by zip code and by neighborhood and by health disparity and you know by all the inequities that you know we can link back to the 1995 heat wave or we could link back to the redlining maps or we could link forward to 
um, to COVID and it's just there and we can, and, and, and that we have to look at it when, you know, we're trying to, you know, bring on this green new deal to help us address the climate crisis. Like that's the map. It's the same map as what Dr. Whitwood would, would say. And it's always the same map until we change that. It's always the same map until we change it. That's that's a, a really important <laughs> quote. I, I got that. Um, but as you and you started listing um, as we were getting ready to bring in some of the other panelists, but as you started listing some of the what I what seems to be some of the goals of the movie, are there some other goals that you had? Well, for this we movie? have a new goal. Uh, okay. We have a new goal. I would say, which is that. In May of 2018, I think it was then, yeah. The first, um, the the first county in the st in the United States declared racism a public health crisis, and they did that reframing, which I thought was like mind-bogglingly brilliant. Now maybe I liked it because I like reframing and I like language, and I think that when you are help when you change language and you know that people know how to understand that language but they might not be able to understand some entrenched stuff that's really hard for them that all of a sudden a light bulb goes off and their heart can shift a little bit and their brain can shift a little bit and like oxygen and blood goes pumping in all the right places that you know helps them put their synapse together and so oh racism is a public health crisis well I mean, after this year, most of us would probably agree that we're not really good at addressing public health crises. But when you add the word health crisis to anything, when you add the word crisis, you add that word public health crisis, and we know we do have an infrastructure. Is it underfunded? Yes. Do we give them the respect that they deserve? No. Did we listen to them when we could have? Well, we didn't, but we have a new president that's trying to. That said, the public health world is an extraordinary world. You know, and if we actually listen and use the public health data that we have, we can use it in some very radical ways. And if we attach disaster and crisis to it, we might actually move on that and move a little faster. So when um, Milwaukee County um, made that declaration, they got a huge amount of press. Everyone was like, whoa, that's really interesting. And then Cook County did it. And since then, over 200 different um, entities, be they state entities to some extent, county ent entities, um, be they public health departments, you know, be it the CDC itself, everybody's declaring public racism, public health crisis. Now the question is, what happens after you make that declaration? And does that declaration include an officer of equity? Does it include an office that's really looking at inequity? Does it include rethinking how disaster preparedness works and the millions and millions and millions, I'm telling you, dollars that are spent through grants in every county in this country, through Homeland Security on disaster preparedness, which you could see in the film, they need to be trained, but you know, maybe it'll, it's more cost effective to invest in community health workers and give them $250,000 than to buy the next new truck or to have a fancy weekend. So my goal now is to use Cooked to support the movement to declare racism a public health crisis and turn those declarations into very real public policy that has teeth and in the same breath as the reparations movement, repurpose disaster preparedness dollars and repurpose public health dollars to invest in the communities that have been divested from for decades and to change uh, to change the status quo. That is, I think we have a lot to unpack. Thank you for starting us out, Judah. <laughs> but you guys, I, we want to hear from everybody else now, please. Yeah. We definitely do because you just, you, I think you really kind of set the stage. You, you actually started um, opening up. I see Dr. Easterlin was like, he, he was ready to jump in on that one. Um, <laughs> you started opening up the space for uh, Dr. Easterlin to come in. And so I know we have a, a, a clip that was going to lead us into Dr. Easterlin. And I'll, I'll, then I'll 
state the question. So that's our that's goal. And we're calling our campaign Beyond Declarations. Beyond Declaration. I love it. This is a map that has two things going on in, at the same time. We've put these circles in those communities that have the highest poverty rates. And then what we've done is we've shaded in the communities that had the highest uh, mortality rates from the heat. And as you can see, they're almost perfect overlaps. So the question is, did people die of the heat or did they die of the social conditions in these neighborhoods? And the answer is both. I mean, had the heat not occurred, they wouldn't have died that week, that's for sure. But they would have died too soon anyway. And the social conditions place them in, in a, uh, an ambiance or, or an environment in which uh, the heat would be most likely to strike these people and to kill them. Thank you for that. And so this leads us into our panelists coming in. So panelists, this is the question that I'm asking. And it's the, it's the same question that I'm gonna um, pose to everyone. And the question simply is, how do you see racism as a public health crisis, right? And how can you relate what you learned from the movie into the work you're currently doing? And so we're gonna start with Dr. Eastman, welcome. Paul, thank you so much. Uh, it is certainly an honor to be joining you all uh, from the College of Staten Island. And certainly wanna thank uh, the Co College of Sustainability for, for hosting this important panel and discussion. Uh, you know, I, I'll just say, and Judith, thank you so much for your important work. Uh, about three years ago, or excuse me, um, several years ago, we we hosted a uh, a movie uh, show just for uh, your documentary uh, because of the work that uh, that we were doing at the New York City Department of Health, really looking at heat vulnerability in New York City. And so it's really good to be joining you and uh, and, and really talking about this work. So um, how we see, uh, I think racism, declaring this, this uh, racism as a public health crisis um, really uh, amplifies why we need to um, marshal all of our resources um, behind this crisis. Uh, I think one, uh, it really frames the, the, the importance of thinking internally the transformation that needs to happen within institutions uh, and within government. And so, you know, you lifted up Milwaukee uh, and, you know, and, and the work that they did in Milwaukee and making sure, uh, you know, that we are calling out, you know, Dr. Kowalik and uh, Lynette, who were, you know, Black women who said that as government, we need to declare racism as a public health crisis. We need to make sure uh, that we are thinking about ways in which we are um, acknowledging the structure and these systems and how they perpetuate uh, racism, but the important part of the action, right? And, you know, that action looks um, in a number of different ways. And I think the investment in organizations to think about internal transformation and training, um, also thinking about the ways in which we use our data uh, and really calling out how race and ethnicity is quite often unknown or missing. Uh, and how we report our data. And so that really limits our ability uh, to, to marshal and drive resources and be targeted in a way that we need to be. Uh, and we certainly saw this as a, as a major issue within um, our COVID data uh, and really thinking about our response and really thinking about how we can really um, tell our interventions. And so we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, but really, I think um, uh, some key ways are looking at um, not only our research, but also um, our budget. Uh, and I think we have to be uh, really, really intentional and explicit uh, that um, we're playing catch up, right? And we've seen disinvestment, uh, underinvestment, under-resourced neighborhoods, um, and particularly with health. I think this is a framing that really allows us not only to think about one agency like the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, um, but really the entire administration, right? Um, and what are ways that you can not only use the data to talk about those injustices, um, but quite frankly, talk about the strengths within those neighborhoods and really honor the community-based organizations, um, the, the networks, the mutual aid societies that have already grown out of this need of survival, right? You know, we cannot come in and swoop in and say, we're here to save the day. I mean, people have really 
you know, like really laid themselves down to really make sure that they protected their communities. Uh, folks who have not been honored within a traditional healthcare system, and I'm talking about community health workers, who we continue to push to be reimbursed uh, through the traditional healthcare system, or doulas uh, who continue to provide the emotional support uh, for black and brown women throughout this city. And so there are so many ways in which we're already perpetuating and we need to understand what we need to do now um, uh, to correct some of the wrongs, but how can we drive this attention away from uh, you know, sort of the healthcare system to really reinvest back into communities uh, or any other system uh, that we've over invested in, uh, we've over criminalized uh, and really taken that away from black and brown communities. And I think, you know, that is, um, I think it's a, it's a huge shift uh, in just the way that we do um, our work overall. And I think this is the opportunity for us to push forward. I wanna thank you for what you said because I, I'm, I'm looking at some of the points that you made that would help move this along, which you talk about training, you talk about data, data, but I think one of the big areas that people don't normally talk about is the budget. You know, you talked about <laughs> adding that to a budget line it shows commitment, right? And, and so by you talking about that was really helpful, but just one, one more question, just to remind people that um, all my panelists, we're gonna have seven minutes, but so I'm gonna ask you some questions in between those. Um, what I wanted to just add is, what do you think that it means, because it's important to highlight for our students that are here, um, that we have our first deputy commissioner and chief equity officer in New York City. What do you think that that means for us? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's an acknowledgement. Um, you know, I think at, the, at a very personal level, I think that we are acknowledging, we talk about, you know, paying homage to the land, right? And, you know, when Judith is calling out, like we're standing on hollow ground, um, but we're also building on a legacy uh, that we have to acknowledge the wrongdoings, uh, even of our, our administration, my agency, and many institutions, um, you know, and really thinking about, and, you know, most recently I watched the documentary, uh, Dope is Death, uh, that was really talking about um, the work that the Young Lords and the Black Panther Party did in, in the Bronx, really supporting individuals um, who were uh, really dealing with substance abuse in the work of um, Brother Dr. Mumia Abu um, Jamal and many others to, to, to support the Lincoln Hospital Detox Center. Yeah. Um, and, and there were uh, policies, there were decisions. Um, by law, by legal makers, policymakers within this own city, and partly um, of the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, that actually led to the closing uh, of that uh, of, the, of that uh, program. And so, when you're talking about what does it mean for me to step in this role, is also to understand that you know we're trying, we're we're changing the course of history, uh, and we're righting some wrongs. Um, but also this is an opportunity for us to do the transformation. And I think leading with um, not only uh, decisions and expertise and degrees, but also coming up and in 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 showing up in an authentic way uh, and really bringing culture to, to this work is really important. And I think that um, changes the way that we talk about this work uh, and, and connecting to people. Uh, and connecting to, you know, our joy, our liberation. Thank you so much. And so, and as as we're thinking about this, right now, we just got some information from Dr. Eastland at on the at the New York City level. So I think it would be really good for us now to move into the Staten Island borough level, right, Dr. Montello. So, Dr. Montello, same question, right? I'm going to pose to you, right? So, you know, as you begin to think about it and hearing what Dr. Eastland just said, how do you see racism as a public health crisis and how can you relate what you learned from the movie into the work you're currently doing? So, good evening, um, everyone. Thank you, Paul. And uh, thank you, Nora and the CSI team first for inviting me and um, um, really an honor to be with this esteemed panel. Um, so, um, I um, really want to start off, um, so I wear a number of hats, and uh, I will say that, um, you know, one of the hats is um, I chair um, a, um, the medical ecosystem that oversees disaster preparedness on Staten Island. So not only as a public health physician, uh, but also as someone who oversees a coalition. Um, it is really hard to ignore uh, what the data and the research is showing us. Um, it, it really is uh, shown us that uh, racism has a profound negative impact 
on both the physical and mental health of millions of people uh, in my minority populations and communities of color. Uh, we also know and, and really cannot deny that racism is deeply embedded in our society and, and not only affects uh, how, where people live, learn, play, uh, worship and receive healthcare, but also that it prevents individuals from attaining the highest level of health that they are able to, to attain. Um, and, and racism also creates inequities in access. And we, we spoke about that already uh, to, a, to a range of benefits like housing and, and um, education and employment and wealth, uh, the so-called social determinants of health. And these social determinants of health are ultimately the ones that drive um, um, the health outcomes. So I thought that uh, for today, um, I would, as you mentioned, Paul, really bring it to the local level uh, and perhaps share some maps and data, um, um, you know, showing uh, some of the uh, disparities uh, on Staten Island. I know uh, perhaps uh, are not familiar with the island and they might be commuting. Um, so just to show that, um, you know, really quickly, uh, Staten Island has a, a population of 475,000 uh, individuals and it's divided into three community boards uh, or districts. Um, and it is uh, by population, the smallest out of all the New York City boroughs. Um, but interestingly, the median household income is um, over 80,000, uh, which actually is just behind Manhattan for the highest in the city. And uh, we find that our population is rapidly aging and over 65 um, there is a growing number and also uh, a lot of uh, children uh, under the age of 18 years of age. Uh, and just to give you a, a, a sort of a sense at a snapshot, almost 75% uh, of the population is white. Now, looking at Stand Staten Island as a whole, the data reveals a borough with limited risks to child and family well-being. And, um, you know, all, but, but uh, the interesting thing is as you start to unpack this uh, and look at different communities and different zip codes and different neighborhoods, um, the story is very different. So um, here's a zip code map, and we've been um, showing a lot of zip code maps, so I, I really thought it was important um, to show the Staten Island zip code map. Um, and we have three uh, community districts, um, uh, the North Shore, Mid Island, and South Shore, uh, which is Community Board 1, Community District 1, 2, and 3. Uh, but if you talk to people that are from Staten Island, they'll really tell you it's, a, it's about a tale of uh, two cities, the North Shore and the South Shore. Um, so what, what do I mean by that? Uh, now, when you start to look a little bit deeper, uh, there is um, a lot of diversity happening on Staten Island. And the North Shore, in fact, is one of only 10 community districts in the city where no racial or ethnic group represents more than 40% of the population. So on the North Shore, we have about 36% white, and then uh, we start to see um, um, much higher rates of people of color uh, as compared to the rest of the borough. In fact, the North Shore resembles more um, New York City, whereas the South Shore resembles more New York State and other parts of the country. Uh, even within the North Shore neighborhoods, we start to find that there is a big difference um, in, in the different uh, neighborhoods and um, also high disparity in the, in the income and proportion of uh, residents living in poverty and, uh, and affluence. Um, in fact, um, the Citizens Committee for Children, when they did an analysis, um, they found that um, the, the uh, looking at the risks, the North Shore ranked about 25th out of 59 community districts in, in the city. But what was worrisome is that, that these numbers are, are going up compared to the, the previous analysis. So it, it is, um, the risk is getting um, uh, higher. So just to uh, sort of uh, pivot a little bit, but but not really. Is you know it's in it's um, like the movie said, and where we we know well now that the zip code of residence is really an important predictor of health disparity, and where these residents where the residents live matters in determining the health and the health outcome. So um, what I wanted to just show was a, a map um, uh, which shows us the community needs um, um, uh, index of Staten Island. And that is really calculated and it's scored based on a scale of one to five based on socioeconomic factors or what we what I referenced um, and we've been talking about uh, previously, the social determinants of health. And that's uh, your income uh, or the poverty level, 
um, the culture and language, minority populations, uh, English language barriers, education, insurance, and housing status. And, and um, these community, uh, this community needs index is uh, often used by hospitals and health systems to really um, um, sort of evaluate who are the uh, most vulnerable and who would end up, for example, in um, the emergency room and, and hospitalized for um, a particular um, health condition. And you could see on Staten Island, even though um, the island at large and um, is, is at about a moderate um, risk, overall risk, um, it is, if you looked at it as a whole, the community needs index is a um, little bit lower than the city. But when you start to look um, uh, you know, at it more by zip code, you start to see these uh, neighborhoods in the North Shore that are, uh, have the, you know, a very high uh, needs index. And data shows that these are the ones with the greatest poverty and also people that are uninsured as well as those that are racially and um, uh, ethnically uh, diverse, these neighborhoods. Um, so, um, you know, we're, uh, when now we look at these uh, and we start to overlap these zip codes with zip codes uh, of where you find the highest disease burden, we, t we start to see a pattern, uh, just like we saw in the movie, highest rates of asthma hospitalizations, um, heart disease, cancer, diabetes hospitalization, behavioral health hospitalization, infant mortality, and the, and the list goes on. Um, so clearly this is not a coincidence. Uh, we've seen this time and time again and um, well, even you know, well before the COVID pandemic, and it really begs us and, and brings us to the question as to why these health disparities are more appa apparent in these poorer communities and communities of co color. So it's no surprise that just as you know, we in, in the documentary um, that these, when we look, these are the communities where there's poor infrastructure, where that were these were the communities that were um, affected and where redlining occurred. Uh, there's fragile low-income city and um, there's NYCHA, uh, NYCHA housing. Uh, one supermarket for every, say, 20 or 25 bodegas on the North Shore. Less resources for school, no safe sidewalks. And, you know, th this list goes on and on. And um, so, uh, you know, what is, uh, what is our goal? Really, our goal, um, as far as I can see it, is to really foster a deeper understanding and work together. So how can we uh, collectively address, um, not just as, as Judith said, uh, declare a public health emergency, but really think about what can we do together to really um, sort of, we, we know that we know the story, we know the narrative. Um, and, and I have to really thank Dr. Easterling and the health department, uh, not only for taking a lead on this, but always willing you know, to partner and guide us um, in these conversations. Um, and fortunately for us, CDC has also um, not only declared this a public health emergency, but they've looked at the social uh, vulnerability index um, in order to help public health officials and emergency respond, uh, respond you know, planners to meet, uh, to make sure that these social uh, and more vulnerable communities uh, can have resources to recover. Um, and so they created the social vulnerability index. So I want to really wrap up with uh, talking for a minute about our coalition, uh, Paul, if that's okay. Um, so uh, we, um, the COAD or the Community Organizations Activated in Disaster um, is a coalition managed by the Staten Island Not-for-Profit Association. Uh, and COAD was started by a group of non-for-profit leaders as an effort post Sandy, really to ensure the vo that the voice of the community-based organizations and not-for-profit organizations, grassroots organizations, was included during and after dis disaster. So when the COAD initially started, they were they focused on situational awareness and provided oppor you know providing opportunities for learning, sharing resources, and and building a culture of preparedness. But since then, and um, particularly since the COVID pandemic, uh, it has really morphed to become a, a coalition that that was activated in in disaster. And we're fortunate that the COAD um, and its medical ecosystem, which consists of many medical providers, the hospitals, uh, local physicians, mental health providers, EMS providers, pharmacy, and others, um, we're funded through the health department to do this work. Um, we've done a lot of work through COVID, and, and I'm really not going to go into details, uh, but I will say that um, we, through successful partnership, uh, between the, the COAD, the medical ecosystem, and the Staten Island Borough President's Office, we were able to set up a local incident command system. 
uh, an emergency operating center. We met daily early on in the pandemic and then weekly, and now we continue to meet uh, weekly and biweekly. And we did a lot of fundraising. We made sure we um, uh, provided resources to the vulnerable uh, parts of our community. And we didn't exclude anyone, even if they were not part of the coalition. Uh, we did lots of needs assessments. And, and now, um, as we move forward, we are building on our learning from our experiences, building on what we've learned, and we really are uh, revamping and redoing our communication and response plan. And as part of that, um, the COAD, as Paul, you um, obviously well know, um, uh, Sharmila and Frank, who um, sort of spearhead and run the, the not-for-profit uh, association and, and COAD, They've been part of your equity and belonging, and I want to give them a shout out. And um, yes. really, we continue to network and expand the efforts with the grassroots as well as the CBOs. We really want to have their voice. Uh, we have a lot of public health campaigns um, and a lot of resources that we are um, uh, trying to uh, provide as well as needs assessments. So I know that was a lot. So I'm going to stop right here and um, see if um, if um, you want to move on to the next pal panelist or is there anything else you wanted me to? We're going to we're going to connect this all. Yes, we're gonna I, connect I this certainly all. hope so. Yeah, no, we're going to connect it. What's really been good is we, we heard from Dr. Eastland, right? What's happening at the, the city level. And you really gave us a really good picture of some of the things that's happening at our borough level. Um, so now, before we cycle back around to all of us again, now we get to hear from Dr. Humphreys, who could really kind of help us to see what's happening at the university level, right? So we're trying to work our way through the systems. Good evening, everyone. Myron Humphreys here. Um, just want to thank um, Dr. Archibald and the CSI team for inviting uh, me here today to speak um, on some of the initiatives that we're doing at CSI. I also want to say how truly honored I am to be on the panel um, with just a, 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 a great cadre of folks who are just doing work in the city. And um, I, I just really value the work and I'm learning so much today about how it works together. So thank you for inviting me. And um, Judith, um, the, the movie is just wonderful and I, I just, I appreciate when we take stories that have really happened and we, we, we tell them in human ways that get to systemic truths. And so thank you for doing that with Cook. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about <clears throat> how our program has sort of um, had, a, ha had a conversation with what we've been talking about in terms of inequities on, and specifically to Staten Island and um, you know, uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Matello because you did a great job of really highlighting um, the disparities on Staten Island and how how they work and 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 the relationship that exists in in the geography and how those inequities come about. Um, I want to I wanted to start a little bit with the history of the islands. And Paul, you can um, uh, you can move to the next slide. Uh, you know, the geography of the islands as as we've talked a little bit about today has a history of ex specifically exploiting and isolating historically marginalized populations and the geography of an island lends itself to that. And this has also disproportionately impacted the bodies of black and brown uh, people. And we can see that through Welfare Island, Rikers Island, Randall's Island, Staten Island are examples of this in the city. And in Staten Island, uh, you know, this calculated use of land um, has also created uh, inequities. Um, if we look just simply at the infrastructure and the limited and expensive infrastructure that it takes to come in and out of the island, if you're driving the Verrazano uh, Narrows Bridge is the most expensive toll in the country. And um, this historically um, is, is building on a narrative that has created conditions for inconceivable horrors and atrocities. And one of those examples, if we look at the history is where our college of Staten Island is situated on the Willowbrook State School. And um, unknown to many at the Willowbrook State School, African-Americans and Puerto Ricans um, constituted the largest, uh, largest black and brown population in a mental health facility in all of the state of New York. So its impact, um, has often not been um, articulated in the history um, because it was a, a, 
a methodology and an approach to uh, getting more support politically. Um, if you say it's black and brown, will people still support you know, closing? And so we don't know those stories as well, but the impact of the history continues to transform in modern day stigmas. And um, we saw a little bit about that today. Uh, Dr. Mantello shared about the North Shore and, and, and what's happening in the North Shore and these inequities. Um, sometimes in the borough, uh, residents will refer to this divide between Staten Island and the North and South Shore um, and how deep it runs as, you know, the expressway being the Mason-Dixon line. And so uh, when we think about this, I wanted to just share uh, a, few, a, few, uh, a few facets that I think um, we looked at, but we can look a little bit more at it. Um, Paul, can you move to the next slide, please? Um, so if, if we look at the divide uh, between the North and the South, we'll see that the North Shore, as we've said, uh, is predominantly uh, residents are black and brown. We can also look at the hyper segregated housing, right? And specifically looking at policy, the current residential zoning laws prohibit attached low cost housing on the South Shore. Um, and yet um, where uh, people of color are for the most part clustered in hyper-segregated low to moderate income neighborhoods in the North Shore, and also the rates of incarceration and arrest. And um, uh, one example of that is just looking at the marijuana arrest in 2019. And we know the 120th precinct, where is the same precinct where Eric Garner was murdered in 2014. Um, this, the, the arrest there and also the rates of incarceration far outpace the rest of the borough and most of New York City. And so uh, when we're considering these barriers to well-being of people of color on Staten Island, um, one of the things that I think we could miss a lot if, if we simply predicted that resolving these inequities would readily be resolved if we just built more affordable housing on the South Shore. Um, and policies that solely look to integrate and create opportunities to integrate and solely look at that can create opportunities to collect diverse people together in a different location, but the quality of those relationships will depend on a number of invisible factors. So I wanted to talk a little bit about those invisible factors. And uh, public health researchers have confirmed this as well in terms of looking at uh, toxic stress, what we like to call un uncontrollable stress. Uh, a stress that's characterized by a feeling of uh, lacking self, lack, lacking control, lacking safety or peace that one can control in one's community. And for example, uncontrollable stress could look like uh, coming with the awareness of the danger when interacting with the police and having to do that in a very consistent daily way. Um, you know, my 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 niece. Uh, my, my niece's uh, son just turned 18 and uh, he's getting his license and it should have been a point of celebration. And she was incredibly stressed and worried about what it would mean for him to have his license and driving and, and, and the, the possibility of getting pulled over. Those are examples of toxic stress that we don't necessarily see, but don't get changed by simply creating more opportunity for people to um, aggregate in different spaces. And so these toxic form, forms of stress are a primary way that social inequities are embedded within the bodies of black and brown people. And we can leave that out uh, as an important part of attending social and relational spaces and the importance of looking at what gives social and relational spaces internal meaning and vibrancy. And so when we think about deep transformational change in terms of racism, it can't happen simply by having a checklist of quotas that we meet or uh, one and done trainings on DEI. I, I really appreciated uh, what Dr. Uh, uh, Easterling spoke about in terms of galvanizing the community that's been doing this work um, um, for so long and our experts in understanding their community and the context and the different ways that they have learned how to uh, mitigate and survive and thrive 
um, by creating um, contextual supports. And uh, when we think about the foundation of undoing racism, you know, it's the same way we have to think about relationships and how relational foundations are going to be the thing that shift not only the inclusion, but the quality of that inclusion. So how, so how do we create public institutions, mental health treatment centers, housing, working spaces, public parks that connect people to their deeper sense of belonging? And so we can, um, you can move to the next slide. Uh, thank you. Uh, John, Paul, uh, John Powell describes this as, you know, the embodied experience of belonging. And so we, we, we talk about equity um, in the work that we do, but we also talk about belonging um, because belonging is more than just feeling included. It, in a healthy and thriving society, belonging means that your well-being is, is being considered, your ability to design and give meaning to structures and institutions is realized. So the importance of relationships is deeply informed how um, our Staten Island Equity and Belonging Project um, moved forward. It is a blueprint for our project. Um, the Staten Island Equity Project was developed with the sponsorship of the CSI Department of Social Work, our School of Health and Sciences, the Rivera Fund for Social Work and Disability Studies, as well as a small grant from the Council on Social Work. And there are currently two parts to the project. Uh, the first part was just having us get a, a, a sense of the landscape of, of people's <laughs> quality of relationship and experience, attitudes and perspectives on Staten Island. And so this is a, a borough-wide survey public opinion poll to better understand the attitudes, perceptions um, of residents um, and also to get a sense of what are people's experiences with community belonging on Staten Island. Um, and I, if I have a chance, I'll, I'll share the, the, the survey link so that if you are a resident or if you're a, a longstanding employee, you could participate. That's just a shameless plug there. But along with our borough-wide sur yeah. survey, uh, we also um, formed the Public Conversations for Change Leadership Fellows uh, initiative and this was designed to be a community of practice uh, where we worked with you know really outreaching to a broad range of diverse stakeholders looking at how we could invite self-advocates neighborhood activists college students nonprofit leaders human service professionals educators academics to come together to cultivate a space for civic dialogue um, where we could share ideas, knowledge, experiences, resources to create a common language, but also a common agenda for fostering equity and belonging on Staten Island. Um, it's important to know um, that thinking about creating an ecosystem of equity and belonging where people are sharing ideas and resources and have a common language is uh, is difficult work, it's challenging work when we move beyond transaction and into relationship. But the, that has been the crux of the process of the PCCLS that I think is incredibly unique. It places relationship building at the center of transformative justice and community accountability um, in a way that works not only through uh, quotas and through accountability numerically, but through relational accountability. And so uh, we, we, we can move to the next slide, Paul, thanks. Um, and so that's our, you know, that's our aspiration for the work that we're doing at the PCCLF. You know, it's to move towards liberation, you know, similarly to what we've been talking about today. What does it mean for, you know, people to, to truly have their, their bodies safe, thriving and belonging in, in, our, in, our, in our world, in our nation, and in our communities. And so, um, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now this is where I get everybody involved, right? The, all the panels. I want you to begin to, I want you to actually, it's, it's good that you have this, this picture up, right? Because as people were talking across from the development of the documentary, the film, right? To the New York City work, 
to the Staten Island Borough work, to the university work, right? How do you think, I want you to think about this, panelists, how do you think we can move, you see that wall, right? Initially, you see that people are adding boxes, right? Help move from equality to equity, but how do we remove that wall, that racism wall? What do you think we would need to do? What are some strategies do you think we can begin to start thinking about in the work that we're doing together? Because this is a collaborative effort, right? That we can do together um, to remove that wall. Who would like to take that first? I think yeah, that's <laughs> I'll jump in. Yeah, I think the removing the wall first, I think, and, and we cannot uh, emphasize this enough, that folks have to realize that there is a wall that's even there to begin with. And we, we're talking about a documentary that has been available for us for years. And we're here in 2021 and we're still seeing the wall. And so that that's very clear to us that we're not learning, right? We're not even acknowledging that some people have this wall and this wall is systematically structured in a way that is to leave people out based on a, a construct that has been developed by human beings. And so this is, this is very intentional. It's intentional that the wall is there. It's intentional that I wanna be blind to that wall because that wall does not affect me. And until we acknowledge that the wall is there not only for some people and that uh, their liberation is very much tied to everyone else, then you know, we're, we're, we have a lot of work to do. And so this is why it's so important that we have this discussion, but the harder work is really to um, uh, really engage uh, in, in where people are, right? Dealing with biases, uh, talking, not just talking about structures, but the ways in which people are making decisions, the policies, how we assign resources and allocation. That's what we wanna to get to, but we have to really start um, you know, from ground zero. Uh, and I think that's the conversation that, that that's where we have to begin. No, thank you for that. That was um, the way that you responded to that was helpful. Um, and as I was thinking, um, Jeannie, cause you, you listed a number of activities that are going on on the island that are moving towards helping us to get rid of this wall. So as we uh -huh. begin to think about that, I'm, I'm just thinking for our students that are out there, some of our grassroots um, folks that are out there, how can we become more involved in that process of helping to remove that wall? <laughs> Paul, I, um, I think, um, you, you know, um, going back to, um, what Dr. Easterling was referencing also, and um, uh, really acknowledging the role and the, uh, but also the social hierarchies that exist in our nation across the board, you know, starting from, you know, within organizations to, um, to, to beyond. And um, uh, really, we I think we have to think um, uh, creatively, but also I think institutions and systems play a big part in this. They play a huge role in shaping uh, policies. So, um, you know, we always consider the colleges as, and the hospitals as, as an example, as anchor institutes uh, in their community. Um, and I think just, um, um, you know, the first thing uh, to do is to show up. Uh, and, and the second thing is to be able to uh, be open and willing to have a conversation. Uh, I personally can tell you I've learned a lot, um, you know, in, in the past um, you know, few months and, and years, um, just uh, uh, being able to hear what, uh, um, you know, what other people in the community are saying. And I, I think that that is important. So it would be, it would really be wonderful, especially as the college is thinking about this as a priority. Um, and, and I feel like oftentimes um, the, the uh, youth can help us uh, in getting, um, you know, spreading the message in the community. So we, can, we have a lot to learn from them. And I think they could certainly be our champions and, and um, go out there in the community to uh, engage uh, with community members, hear what the concerns are in the community and, and um, uh, work together. But, uh, but I feel like the first thing uh, to do is to say, yes, we are going to work together. We're willing to work together. We are gonna show up. 
uh, with an open mind and an open heart. And, um, um, you know, the strategies will come, but we have to, we have to show up first. Awesome. Judith, now, you know, you know, I was coming to you. So based uh, on, go ahead. Well, I want to, I mean, I was very moved by your co-ad example, Ginny. Um, and I really, um, my, Mayra, right? Mayra? Myra. Myra. I was really moved by your slide and your commitment to trying to understand belonging and the power of belonging. And I and and um, Dr. Easterling, and I, I'm so glad that you mentioned that screening that we had um, at the Department of Health and Hygiene and it was an that was one of our most amazing and last face to face events with a public health department that was going to become our model for what we wanted to do all around the country because sometimes having discussions that are kind of private that are just uh, uh, across agencies and give everybody an opportunity to really talk and think and talk out of the box and and you know when you have an outsider like us come in there's always that somebody who's been saying see i've been saying let's invest in the community health workers and the doulas as if they are doing disaster preparedness work because in fact they are because they form the trusted networks and when that covid is going to happen who do you think is going to deliver the ppp you know, who's going to deliver the, the masks and the water and the food? Who's going to understand where the needs are? Who's going to be trusted? It's going to be the anchor institutions in the form of community health workers or youth intervention organizations or people that do stuff that don't look like disaster preparedness, but is. And so that is actually my suggestion is in the spirit of belonging, in the spirit of taking down a wall and feeling truly included and making that that image of like being part of the game and everyone being there with their arms up. Ginny, do you see an opportunity in, in this moment when we've all been able to understand what the role of social cohesion is, the power of it, how important it is, the importance of institutions that build community health in very different kinds of ways and sometimes out of the box. Do you see an opportunity for them to truly be a part of disaster response? And can you imagine taking budgets that would normally might be used for after the after the official disaster and pour it into what we all know and what we saw from your slides into the institutions that are trying to address the the social determinants of disease that are the disaster and we know it like can you build an argument for that because if you can do that i think that becomes a model then that other institutions can can use and like we need precedent setting models in order to for other people to do it and we need to be able to argue that it's a really smart way of spending disaster dollars or public health dollars on community institutions. Um, I think, Judith, uh, you know, I think there's a tremendous opportunity uh, for, as you correctly pointed out, uh, we are very reactive, whether it's healthcare or disaster preparedness or, or you know, you can take any other example. Uh, we, instead of doing the prevention work, uh, you know, we wait for the disaster to happen and, and then we're, you know, sort of back paddling, so to speak. Um, you know, it would be wonderful to have, uh, you know, community hubs, for instance, funded to, to work on prevention and, and also uh, disaster preparedness. I, I'll tell you that some of this work actually with linkages through CSI is already happening. We have um, um, a community health worker that um, a training that was um, uh, put together and funded through our Staten Island Performing Provider System, which uh, had received Medicaid um, and state dollars um, to improve the the uh, well-being and the and the um, outcomes in our community. And we have actually graduated many so uh, community health workers through the CSI program. It was in partnership with uh, CSI, 
And now um, they are creating um, a, a pre-apprentice program. And, and really the narrative for that is uh, training them, teaching them about COVID, uh, about um, you know, um, the test and trace program, uh, about vaccines and really infusing them out into the community to go and educate. And also um, there's um, recently um, through the health department, there's been funding uh, to support some other work where there's gonna be crisis counselors that are working with um, the test and trace um, um, you know, folks that, that Dr. Easterling and his team fund. And these crisis counselors will be going out into the community to address mental health uh, issues that have um, obviously uh, really spiked since uh, the pandemic. Well, I just, I just wanna say that it, in, in the context of the film, I mean, I, I coin a term, the new brand of first responders or first first responders. And, you know, not all people who do community organizing work would normally frame themselves like that, right? But, but I, th I think, I can't say post COVID, but at this moment, I think everybody now realize, oh my God, we've been doing rapid response work. We are a new brand of first responders and we're trusted responders. And so, you know, I think we're public health crisis workers. I, I think that whatever the term is, I think, it's, I think it's very apt. And when you make that reframe, I think it, it's an argument for, um, for investment, budget re in investment from those public health dollars or the disaster dollars. But let's think about that, right? And in, in, instead of think of it in terms of just rebranding, right? Because actually they've been the first responders, right? It's we're catching up to calling them first responders, but they've always been the first responders. And I just think about in communities, when something happens, it's usually a family member, it's somebody in that community that's first on the scene that has to respond to that. Um, so if we understand that based on what Judith is saying, we can begin to think about, okay, so let's begin to formalize this. Just like what Judith said, I may not even have realized that I'm a first responder. I've just been, you know, when you're doing the work, you don't get the title for the work, you just do the work. But if we could formalize it so that people are clear about the process of doing it, that could shift and change what could happen in some of our communities. So I think as you were talking, I was thinking about that because we've been talking about that um, in the Equity and Belonging Project about community members as first responders, not just the policemen, not just the nurses, but the community members who have been responding. If you watch it, the video that you showed that we looked at with Sandy, it were community members that was making those first response to help people. Um, and so I want us to kind of think about that as we're moving and in, in actually doing innovation, right? In order to move this wall that we're talking about, we're gonna have to start thinking innovatively. Um, I, I just wanna, uh, I think this is a really important point that we're making here about first responders and how do we, um, shift the, the the language of who's included in that and who's not. Um, and I think just the same way that we have other first responders, if we can find ways to affirmatively um, compensate people for that so that they're not just, oh, they, they do it, but they'll do it because they're part of the community, but to really acknowledge that in a way that gives value to it because that's that's another piece of the work where why it becomes anonymous is because it doesn't it it it, it doesn't have any place within the economic system of value so how do we acknowledge that and and not only in economics but in in, in many different ways in, in how we language it how it's included how people are invited to the table to speak on their perspective um and I, and I think doing that is, is part of affirmative policy making. And I think oftentimes, unfortunately, our, posi our, our, our policy making is, is conversant with trying to control bad behavior, <laughs> anti-hate crime. And, and we don't do a lot of affirmative development in our policy making. So how can we create more good relationship in communities? Dare I say it, love, you know? And, and so I think, policy making doing some of that thinking of what does it take to not only 
you know, get people to address the inequities, but how do we create a different kind of relationship with one another um, I, and, and, and incentivizing that? Incentivize. This brings us back to that budget piece, right? That, that, keeps, that keeps coming up because I think if we add these in, um, we're saying we have a commitment to this, not just for the moment, right? Like we, we talked about that. Jenny, you said something so wonderful one time when you said in disasters, we come in to take the community back the way it was, right? Not to change it, not to, just to, we have to put it back the way it was. So that in itself says that we're not committed to moving things along. When we have an opportunity, things were destroyed. So we have an opportunity to move it but no, we don't move it, we put it back. So these are just some of the things that we want to think about. And as we're having this discussion, I wanna make sure we start bringing in some of our people who are out, who are listening, who are talking. I'm sure Amy, you probably have some questions for us. Amy, do you have anything you wanna, anybody wants to know? I, I, yes, I do. We have quite a few. <laughs> so uh, let's just start off. Um, the first, could the speakers explore ideas relating to, the, to public health and the ability to access recreation spaces such as parks and playgrounds. Who, who wants to take that? Jenny, public historian, Dr. Easterlin. Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yes, of course. So the question is, I guess if you or any other speaker would like to explore ideas relating to public health and the ability to access recreation spaces such as parks and playgrounds. Yeah, I think that this is, this is really important um, in the work that we do uh, in sort of reclaiming land and really thinking about reclaiming space uh, as well. Um, you know, some of the work that we, we have done in Brooklyn, uh, you know, in, in my role as assistant commissioner there, um, really working with the, the community to identify ways that, you know, we connect it to ultimately, you know, uh, physical health, um, but also uh, really thinking about um, uh, how this is also important for your mental health. So we were doing things around transportation equity, um, but also activating um, neighborhoods and spaces so that we can increase uh, physical activity uh, and also support mental wellness. Um, and I think that those are ways in which you can you know, engage institutions and organizations and some of the work that's already being done uh, in the community, um, but also sort of think about um, engaging youth. Uh, as I know, Dr. Mantella had raised this um, because you know that, you know, youth are really active in communities and in neighborhoods and park spaces and playground spaces. Um, and so, uh, you know, just thinking about different ways that you can activate it with art and with music, um, you know, and really thinking about some of the activities that could, that could happen. Um, and I think those are relationships that we built with not only community-based organizations, but also with, with schools um, as well. And so this could be, something that sustains not only um, uh, throughout the summer, but something that we've done uh, even during school year as well. And, 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 and that question, oh, go ahead, um, Dr. Montella. No, I was just gonna build on that just really quick um, to say that um, you know there's, there's data to show that if there's a park within 10 minutes walk of someone's house, they, they, their health is, is, um, you know, is better. Um, the, the one thing that we should also remember though on Staten Island, um, we still have to think about walkability, sidewalks, um, you know, safety of the neighborhoods. And oftentimes, and we are the borough of the parks, we have a lot of beautiful parks, but people don't access them for, for numerous reasons. Uh, we know we have some parks in the North Shore, for instance, that, you know, they're, they're not safe because there was toxic waste, um, you know, in the ground. And, and just as an example, so, uh, you know, these are things that we really have to sort of uh, unpack a little bit more and make sure that those neighborhoods that, that have the parks also have the ability to have, uh, you know, safe sidewalks and streets and uh, ways for people to access those parks. So I just kind of wanted to add to, you know, add um, and say, we, we still need to do some work around that. And it's interesting that you started having that conversation because that's what I was going to um, point to um, Dr. Humphrey, because in some of the preliminary results that came out of the, the survey, 
some of people identify not feeling a sense of belonging in some of these areas. And so these are some of the things, Myra, if you can speak to that. Yes, thank you. That's a great point. So many people talked about how, again, that Mason Dixon line. <laughs> so even if they knew of those parks, so even if they knew of parks in the North Shore that were safer than theirs, they didn't feel, uh, you know, a sense of connectedness. And they didn't want to feel awkward, or they didn't want to feel unsafe, or they didn't want to be policed. Um, so people did describe, you know, um, limiting the circumference of what they did to where the spaces were that they felt belonging just even if it didn't have the resources or you know the support that they needed in other ways so you know one of the things even as we talk about par parks public spaces i'm a big proponent of you know public spaces we don't have a lot of them we're losing a lot of public spaces um, um that when we're thinking even about a public park how do we again facilitate people who are there to create community? So there are lots of places around the world where there are park, you know, park coordinators. And what they do is they create community in these public spaces where we get. So I think there are creative ways to think outside of just provision, but again, quality of how we're doing it so that we're addressing some of the reasons why people don't feel connected or when they do connect, they're still not converging in terms of capital and exchanging resources. And if you think about that, what um, Jenny just, I mean, Dr. Montella just talked about is the association between the park and health and wellness, right? So if people are not feeling that this is a place of belonging, that's gonna affect their health, ultimately public health, right? So these are, this is why we're having this discussion so we can, as people are asking some of these questions, we can tie it in so people can understand why there's an association between recreation and parks, racism, and health. Thank you for that question. Amy, can we get? Yes, a lot more are coming in. So um, the next question, and this is um, for Dr. Mantello and Dr. Easterling. What have you learned after Superstorm Standy that helped you during the COVID pandemic? Who wants to go first? <laughs> you want to start? Um, you know, well, well, I'll just say uh, I actually was not at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene uh, during um, during Sandy. Um, you know, I was actually uh, still um, leading a clinical practice in Newark, New Jersey. Um, but, you know, I will say two things. Um, and I think this point certainly has been uh, really carried through in the documentary. Um, just that, you know, structural racism really uh, is amplified uh, in, in disasters. And we certainly saw this in, um, you know, parts of the Far Rockaways, parts of the island, um, other parts of uh, Queens, um, uh, where, you know, based on certain neighborhoods, on zip codes, we, we know that um, because of the vulnerability, uh, it left people uh, with, with uh, um, you know, substandard uh, both housing, but also it just left them really vulnerable even to, um, you know, mental health concerns and issues that we continue to see today uh, and we continue to work on uh, as a result of uh, Superstorm Sandy. Um, and then also just to connect to some other uh, outbreaks like uh, Zika, as we were navigating Zika in 2016, uh, and even Legionella's uh, shortly thereafter in the Bronx, um, that when you are um, addressing these, uh, these outbreaks and these emergencies, um, vulnerability really uh, leaves people, um, you know, uh, without the resources that they need, and they do not have the access. And so, but it's not just individuals, but we also know that the institutions, you know, as you saw the connection to redlining, thinking about the healthcare systems that are closely connected in close proximity, where you know that individuals uh, from black and brown communities, from lower income communities are going. So you can think about federally qualified health centers, our safety net hospitals are quite often um, do not have enough resources that once you certainly hit a threshold um, are unable to really service um, the entire community. And so that's where government really has to step in. 
And we saw this with COVID-19, our FQHCs did not have enough um, personal protective equipment, our safety net hospitals did not have enough PPE, not have enough testing resources. And so this is where we know that um, we really have to be intentional in the ways in which we're talking about setting up our resources, investing uh, in our safety net infrastructures and systems to ensure that we are uh, really servicing um, low income communities and black and brown communities. Anything you want to Sure, uh, thank you for that, Dr. Easterling. So um, I was not in this current role uh, either, but I was certainly doing some public health uh, at a more local level in my community, um, just volunteering at, um, um, at our local hospitals and, and um, uh, you know, at schools. Uh, what I will say is that um, one of the things, even though uh, if you look at the um, sort of flood zones on Staten Island, um, and you look at uh, a lot of the, um, uh, you know, sort of periphery of, of Staten Island, all the, the communities that are part of the shore shoreline, um, and look at those maps, uh, we saw that there were uh, many communities in the, in, you know, in the North Shore and South Shore that were uh, affected by Sandy. But we look at now, almost 10 years later, the recovery of those communities, right? And we see how uh, many of those uh, low income and, and um, um, you know, communities are still, they still haven't bounced back. And, um, and, and Paul, what I was saying was that, you know, it's interesting that we have an opportunity to build better than where we started, but yet, you know, FEMA, Red Cross, we learned that all they're required to do is come and put the community back to where they found it, not improve it, which to me is, is just, um, it's mind boggling. So, we, we certainly, uh, on a positive note, uh, really not only uh, post-Sandy, but also post-COVID, saw our community come together in a really, really remarkable way. Uh, you know, people were going knocking from door to door. Uh, we had, we realized that, that we had, um, and, and this is also some of the work that Nora had helped us with, we didn't know who were the, the most vulnerable, who were the ones that were on oxygen, who were the ones that uh, had no medications left, who had you know no electricity. So we got our civic associations involved. We had people knocking from door to door, uh, just making sure their neighbors were, were well. Um, so you know some of those, um, uh, you know having learned some of those lessons uh, this time around, and this is why the work of the co-ad is so important, is that we made sure we had those. Um, uh, not-for-profits and those uh, neighborhood um, community-based organizations and civics and grassroots organizations at the table because we knew that, um, you know, ultimately they're the ones who will be able to bring um, whatever message it is, whether it's a mess message from the CDC or the health department or, or whoever, you know, in order to be able to bring um, resources and, and messages uh, back to the community as well as get, you know, find out what their needs are, we need, we need those uh, grassroots um, organizations. Um, so I think, I think that both Sandy and now COVID has really uh, taught us uh, a lot of lessons. The other thing that Dr. Easterling kind of touched a little bit about was the mental health. I don't think we have seen the tip of the iceberg. And similarly, uh, post Sandy, we saw again, um, you know, we, we saw a lot of mental health and substance use uh, issues and, and use. Yes. Um, you know, those rates went up and we're seeing the same thing with COVID. Initially, there was a dip because people were not going into the hospital uh, and, and people were afraid. Uh, but, but now we're starting to see those numbers spike. And I think we have uh, really not seen any, anything close to what the mental health impact will be of this pandemic. We're not obviously still in the pandemic, but I think it's going to take us years to recover. This is where we need the community health workers and our safety net programs um, you know, and our early intervention really to go work one on one with these families and go into the homes of these people and really help help them recover. Yes, thank you for that. Amy, can, I'm trying to get us a, a few more questions. I know yes, people are I, questions in, I right. know, and they're great questions. We'll do our best. Next, <laughs> actually, we have both a comment and a question from um, Professor Simone Wege, who's chair of the uh, Department of Economics. And her comment that I'll read is that she was a, I was, uh, I was a graduate student at Northwestern in Evanstown, north of Chicago in 1995. I was there when this heat wave happened. It was an awful, awful human tragedy. At the time, I did not have an air conditioner, which was not unusual for the Chicago area since it sits on Lake Michigan. 
The heat wave was so oppressive. I asked a fellow graduate student with an air conditioner if I could stay overnight. It was really an emergency situation. And so the follow-up question to that um, is um, whether or not this event in 1995 prompted urban planners to get better at setting up cooling centers and more of them. And did this help urban areas respond better to heat waves? Uh, and you know, um, again, um, our you know um, our filmmaker Judith can address this, who may be more familiar with Chicago, and of course, Dr. Mantello and Dr. Easterling for the New York City and Staten Island response. Um, you know, I think that they learned a lot about heat waves, um, and they definitely open up more cooling centers, but. I would say that, you know, Dr. I mean, Dr. Whitman and others would say, like, you know, the, the cooling centers aren't the answer. I mean, like, those are, that's, that's like, when it's an acute moment, and you sort of need to go there. I mean, the real answer, you know, the real answer is, 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 is economic development, and making sure that there's like real jobs, and um, real community cohesion, and a real infrastructure, and and a real main street, and a real main street that has you know places where people can eat inside, and where you could sit at a table, and where there's air conditioning inside, and a place where there's a real movie theater, and a place where you know there's a park with a lot of ground cover and tree cover, you know, and fountains so that people don't have to open up you know, feel like they have to open up um, the fire hydrant. But, you know, the, one of the reasons why people are going to open up a fire hydrant is because it's on their corner and they know their corner and they have safety in their corner. And they might not go two blocks away to the park because that's a different neighborhood and it might be connected to a different gang or different group of people and they're not going to feel safe. But why... Well, why are they not feeling safe? Because, you know, because what's the local economy? If the local economy economy isn't, you know, is an economy that everybody can really feel safe participating in, then things are gonna get more complicated. So it's never about the cooling center, you know? I mean, cooling centers are good, but that's the last resort. I mean, that was one reason why in the film, I say to Oren, like, do you think and I mean, he looks at me like I'm crazy, but I'm like, wow, like actually growing home is an amazing heat emergency plan because it's doing green job training. It's creating jobs for returning citizens who used to be formerly incarcerated. It took an empty lot or many, many, many empty lots at this point and turned it into gorgeous garden. The garden provides food. The food addresses diabetes. Now it's at a small scale, but if you think about all of these pieces, maybe makes people feel much safer, you know, the, that it could actually be, you know, a heat emergency plan if you think about heat emergency plans differently. Now, I think it's all more complicated during COVID. Too. Um, so I'm always going to go for investing in infrastructure and anchor institutions and organizations that provide jobs, provide health insurance, and are doing social cohesion work that is addressing treatable diseases block by block, it's always gonna be the best disaster preparedness strategy or the best heat emergency plan, hands down in my book. Yeah, and just, yeah, just, to, just to chime in, I cannot agree with Judas, uh, Judas Moore. But you know, one of the things that we did here in New York City, uh, you know, and we we have the cooling centers. You know, there's been a lot of work to increase foliage and think about you know um, all of the different uh, you know resiliency efforts. But one of the things that we have focused on uh, about uh, three years ago, and this is actually why we started. You know, the team looked at um, the the documentary. Uh, is because in the Bronx, where you know, uh, you know, they have been doing a lot of great work uh, in the South Bronx, particularly because of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation County Health Rankings, and uh, out of all the counties, 
uh, they are number 62 uh, in the state. And so uh, they'll work to really become not 62, really looking at the heat vulnerability, the vulnerability index uh, that has been created um, by uh, the, the mayor's office and you know our, um, our team here, the Department of Health. Uh, and so the focus wasn't really on the built environment. It was really on the resiliency efforts. So what is the, how do we build social cohesion? How do we train residents, train community-based organizations to understand you know, what are risk factors and why residents could be more susceptible to heat or some other emergency. And so creating these networks within the neighborhood. Um, and we saw an increase um, you know, of residents being really engaged in these conversations and becoming volunteers and really participating in social engagement events. And so I think that's where we want to really push. And I think that's what Judith was talking about to really invest in these type of resiliency, social cohesion efforts. Um, and I think that's the way in which we can think about you know, policy and data, but also our place-based programs really reinvest in community-based organizations to do this work or already doing this work. Amy, I know. <laughs> Amy, we have another one. We got time for yes. a couple more. We do, and we have we have quite a number of questions, uh, but we'll see how many we can get um, get to. But um, next, we have um, in the same manner that our education system is used to indoctrinate race or racist social constructs. What is the likelihood that these institutions will be used to unlearn them? And what do you think is the greatest resistance to this change? So I don't know. I, Could you repeat oh, that? Yeah. Yes. I'm happy to repeat it. So in the same manner that our education system is used to indoctrinate race or racist social constructs, what is the likelihood that these institutions will be used to unlearn them? And what do you think is the greatest resistance to this change? And if we, we think about that question, Dr. Eastland started to talk about some of this. Um, if Because when you said these institutions, there's a lot of institutions. So <laughs> if I pick, let's say, the health department, right, since that's one of the institutions that's represented here, um, Dr. Eastland started talking about some of those efforts. So you might want to yeah. repeat some of those. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. Um, you know, as I was thinking about the question, certainly uh, it, it's very much tied to, you know, the outcome, right? And so why are people going to educational institutions in the first place? They want to get a job. They want to be able to make money. Um, but the institutions that we want, you know, students to eventually arrive to, we have to hold them accountable. Um, we need our healthcare system to do things differently. Um, we need to be more race explicit in how we are really thinking about our strategies um, to close the gap. Um, you know, Dr. Mary uh, T. Bassett, who uh, was the health commissioner, New York City health commissioner, uh, and at the start of this administration, put out uh, a perspective in a New England Journal of Medicine, well respected um, after the ruling of Eric Garner, and was very clear that there needed to be a challenge to both public health and medical professionals. We can no longer turn a blind eye uh, to how structural racism plays out in our healthcare system. And if, if that's going to be the challenge that we need our educational institutions who are training our medical uh, students, our public health students to do things different, right? To have an anti-racist framework, to think about the, how you're using your, the data. And so who are going to be the next epidemiologists? We, we need you to have race explicit strategies as you're thinking about your data. Who's going to be the next commissioner of, of New York City? Having an anti-racist framing in your leadership practices or thinking about the programs that you are developing and embedding equity assessments so that it really allows who stands to benefit the most. And if we're going to close the gap, how do we ensure that those who are most burdened are going to be centered? And I think those are the principles that we really have to root uh, in our educational practices and making sure that the next generation of leaders who are stepping in to these roles are going to change the way in which we do our work. 
And I, I think um, as you were talking about the Eastland, I'm thinking on the mental health side, right? Um, I, I just think about some of the work that we're doing. Um, and when you talk about what uh, Dr. Montella is talking about, there's a group of people who are very resilient, right? Who will not be affected, be able to cope with what happened. But then there's a percentage of folks who are not going to be able to, and we're going to see this influx of PTSD, right? And people are going to think it's just because of what happened with COVID, because people are not being trained, like you just talked about, on racial trauma. So we're going to miss a whole segment of people who some of that trauma is complicated because of racial trauma. And you're only focusing on one area. So when we talk about the education and the training of people who are going out to do the work, I think in answering that question, and Dr. I'm echoing Dr. Eastland, we have to look at how we're training people to go out and do the work. And I think she started, whoever she or he who, who, and who asked the question, they started out with that. The educational system that uses this model, what are institutions doing? To that's the with the training, the education of people. So we have to do the undoing, the unlearning, right? To start the learning. Yeah, and we and we see the shift during Black Lives Matter a bit. Uh, that when we tie economics to it, uh, that we can um, really advocate for some change. And so that's why I think if institutions are saying, um, I'm really trying to hire individuals who have an anti-racist framing, right? And so you know, in, in the interview, we're looking for trainees, for individuals who have that mindset, who already have the principles, who've been doing the work. And I think those are ways in which we can hold some accountability uh, to the educational institutions to begin to embed this into the work so then students are better prepared. Yeah, you, I was you just going to um, Go also say that, you know, uh, we have to look at our institutions and make sure that we're creating the supports to cultivate students of color, students who represent historically stigmatized populations, because even in, in these, this, this time, if people want to have a, a therapist or a mental health practitioner who has an anti-racist lens, who is black or Lat Latinx or you know, Asian American, the chances of finding that are very difficult. So, you know, we can support it, but if we don't have, a, you know, a, a, a real, outreach and a real focus on how we're going to cultivate and support more people who are prepared, who have the capacity to, to have the degree and, and, and be able to do the work, um, we're going to be pulling from the same dominance. Yeah, right. And that's why as an agency, we're saying that we are working to become an anti-racist organization. So does that mean that anyone who's coming into the organization understands what your mission is? And then if you are here and want to keep the job, that this is the work that you have to do, right? Well, I'll just say as a, as a parent in a, of a public school, of a New York City public school kid, we go to PS75. I mean, I think that we have to, once we all get back to school, I think, you know, we have to really work on the schools and the PTAs and like, that we have to make them welcoming places so that all the parents feel welcome and that they are really included in, in they, they're, they're really included. And I, I think there's so much, there's so much important work that has to be done around anti-racism and, 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 and working on our schools and making them less segregated and truly, truly you know, I don't know belonging. if it's yes. belonging, yes. not just yes. equitable, but belonging. Yeah, but belonging. You know, I okay. think that's going to actually help with like teaching outcomes and educational outcomes and the kids reading better oh, yeah. and all of those yeah. pieces. Amy, I wish we could get some more questions. In. I I wish we did too, but the, the, the last question that I was going to have was just simply what steps is CSI taking to, <laughs> to you know, to, to live up to the statement um, about racism being a public health um, crisis. And I, um, you know, I, I would tell people to stay tuned for more events like this. <laughs> and, um, but I know we're out of time, but I, I was hoping that that would be a, a way to address some of the work that we at CSI are doing, but I think that um, I just it's, it's a good um, follow up to what you were saying about education. And so, of course, yes. 
from the higher education standpoint, the work that we have to start doing the action steps. I mean, Dr. Easterling, do you think that these declarations are really making a big difference? Like, do you think if the bur if each borough, if the borough of Staten Island and CSI said, okay, we're going to declare racism a public health crisis, um, and do some and really, you know, work with that, would that make a big difference? Um, so, you know, I, I think that there is certainly value in the declaration. Um, I think that there, even in the symbolism of uh, ensuring that institutions are, uh, you know, amplifying and elevating the message, um, there are over uh, close to 200 uh, declarations uh, that have been put out since 2018, since uh, Milwaukee, uh, the Wisconsin Public Health Department has declared uh, racism as a public health crisis, most recently being the Center for Disease Control, as we all know. Um, I will say that there are very few that have a declaration that is associated with action, actionable steps. Um, and I, I think I can count on both hands. And so that's where the rubber meets the road. Um, we had to be very concrete and sort of outlining, yes, you know, uh, that we understand that structural racism exists um, and it leads to these outcomes. Um, but where are we thinking about, um, you know, our, our HR, our, our data, our programs, and ultimately the budget? Uh, and I think we have to not only just think about doing the analysis, right? You know, we could talk about, you know, this is like reparations, right? How many times have we studied reparations? And so institutions are going to study structural racism, but there has to be, how are you changing it, right? And so what are the solutions to it? So um, I think that there's a path forward. Uh, and I think where we've seen the examples, uh, King County and Seattle, uh, Milwaukee, um, and certainly um, we plan to be uh, among uh, the few who are really being action oriented in that way. I just want to take this time one, to thank everyone who is supposed to end at eight, right? People stayed on. So I just want to celebrate you for staying with us, right? Panelists, for all of you just staying with us. And so, you know, as we're wrapping it up, right? I, I'm not going to take a whole lot of time because there was just so much to unpack. So we're going to have to take some time to process this. But I just want us to just, just start thinking about what do we need to do? And Dr. Eastland ended it well. What do we need to do to go beyond the declaration? That, that's, that's the question that I just want to leave us with as we start thinking about what is it that, like I stated from the beginning, that we can do together collaboratively that we could not do alone? So that's what I want us to just think about it. And, and so that we, we don't have a lot of time to go into that. But I, that's what I want to leave us with. And, and Nora, can you? Take us in. All right. Thank you so much. What a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for all of you who attended. Um, and I would like to especially thanks, thank our panelists for their willingness to share their time, their expertise to uh, in furtherance of this timely and critical dialogue. I uh, would also like to thank uh, the College of Staten Island uh, um, administration for their support. Thank you very much, uh, President Fritz and uh, Rob Wallace, the VP of Economic Development, Continuing Studies and Government Relations. And most of all, Ishmael Hassan, who made uh, this all possible with the technical support, with the yes. marketing, the graphic design of the, uh, the flyers. And, and, and they were, it was essential. Without him, we couldn't have done this uh, event so successfully. Lastly, I would like to thank our committee, uh, Paul, Amy, and Jasmine, it was a pleasure working with you. I can't wait for another event with you together. And as Paul mentioned, this conversation doesn't end tonight. Racism will continue to affect our community, our students, our friends, our families. This event is not meant to be a single event, but the starting point for the work that must be done to bring the necessary education and awareness that will change our present course. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you.